What if I told you that it used to be that everybody and their mother knew ancient Egypt was a black civilization? I mean across Europe and America now, in the highest institutions of study and among the whitest of white academics. Yes, there was a time when it was a commonly accepted fact, as plain as the nose that isn't on the Sphinx. Once upon a time, everyone knew the ancient Egyptians were black Africans. So what happened? Well, as Mr. Olariwaju and Burner Boy say, that's another story. In this video, part 2 of who were the first Afrocentrists, we're going to be showing that before the whitewashing and Arabization of the ancient Egyptians, the discipline of Egyptology knew and accepted the fact that the ancient Egyptians were a black people. Yes, you heard that right. White historians and archaeologists were Afrocentric before anybody ever thought up the word. So to those crying that Black Wokedom and Jada Pinkett Smith are trying to steal ancient Egypt from modern day Egyptians, we're reminding you that even your great granddaddies disagreed with you. And to begin, we'll start with someone who was the granddaddy of Egyptology. Jean-Francois Champollion, commonly called Champollion the Younger, is the reason we can even read Egyptian hieroglyphics. His work was key to deciphering the Rosetta Stone which led to the understanding of ancient Egyptian writing systems and the ancient Persian cuneiform script. In a letter to his brother Champollion Figiac, while travelling and exploring the ruins at Biban el Molouk aka the Valley of the Kings, Champollion the Younger wrote this, quote, The ancient Egyptians belonged to a race quite similar to the Kanu or Barabras, present inhabitants of Nubia. In the Copts of Egypt, we do not find any of the characteristic features of the ancient Egyptian population. The Copts are the result of crossbreeding with all the nations that have successively dominated Egypt. It is wrong to seek in them the principal features of the old race." End quote. Now, why did Champollion the Younger come to his conclusion about the ancient Egyptians being the same race as the Nubians? Well, simple, because of what he saw. I quote, We admire the astonishing freshness of the painting and the fine sculpture of the tombs. I had a copy of the peoples represented on the bas relief. According to legend, they wished to represent the inhabitants of Egypt and those of foreign lands. Thus we have before our eyes the images of various races of man known to the Egyptian. Men led by Horus belong to four races. The first, the one closest to the god, has a dark red colour, a well-proportioned body, a kind face, long braided hair, slightly aquiline nose, designated men par excellence. There can be no uncertainty about the racial identity of the man who comes next. He belongs to the black race, designated Nahasi. The third man presents a very different aspect. His skin colour borders on yellow or tan. He has a strong aquiline nose, thick, black pointed beard and wears a short garment of varied colours. These are called Namu. Finally, the last one, what we call the flesh coloured, a white skin of the most delicate shade, a nose straight or slightly arched, blue eyes, blonde or red bearded, tall stature, very slender and clad in hairy ox skin, a veritable savage, tattooed on various parts of his body. He is called Tamu, Europeans who in those remote epoch frankly did not cut too fine a figure in the world. Close quote. Later on Champollion puts all doubts to bed and admits quite astonishingly that the ancient Egyptians also designated themselves not only as brown black people with the dark reddish tint Champollion described but goes on to say that elsewhere in the tomb the art on the walls also showed Egyptians represented as jet black Africans. Quote, we find there the Egyptians and Africans represented in the same way, which could not be otherwise. But the Namu, the Asians, and the Tamu, Europeans, present significant and curious variants. End quote. Now here's the image I believe he was talking about. It's not one that you can easily come by. I had to troll the internet for this. And I believe there's a controversial history behind that also. Again, that's for another video. For now, pay attention to how the two black figures here differ only in minute elements of their fashion. Regardless, 
ultimately both are black skinned. You see apparently the red brown colour was interchangeable with the jet black one. As you can see on other wall reliefs such as this one, clearly showing captives from Nubia, some dark brown with the red tint and some jet black. But is it really a mystery what was going on here? Do you need to spend 10 years and a million bucks getting a PhD in Egyptology before making sense of wall art? Nope, Champollion didn't. Because as we've explained in other videos, black people come in different shades of brown with the most intense shades giving off the deepest black that a lot of people have and others don't. Except that what Egyptology did after the likes of Champollion the Younger was to mystify this brown reddish shade and call it symbolic or to reproduce the images in textbooks with a ridiculously lighter tint so that people didn't really know what they were looking at. But we now know how much of a fraud this is because the Egyptians also depicted Nubians in this same brown red shade. And even more than that, if you go to Sudan and look at the art on the tombs of Nubian and Ethiopian kings, you frequently get the same brown red shading used to depict Nubians. Were the Nubians saying that they went black Africans? Of course not. At least we can all agree on that. Apart from the trolls in the comments who are getting ready to say Nubians were also white Middle Easterners. In any case, if the Egyptians were the same hue as Middle Easterners aka modern day Egyptians, then why didn't they depict themselves as having the same skin tone as the Asian contingency with the yellowish tan tint which Champollion describes? Furthermore, the hair texture we see on the so-called red Egyptians can only be described as negro hair. Look closely at many depictions and you will see the curly kinky texture of the ancient Egyptians hair just like Herodotus the ancient Greek historian described. Judge for yourself, do the wall paintings of these Egyptians look more like these people, modern day Egyptians, or more like these people who live deeper within Africa today, the Afar people, many having the same hairstyles you see on the tomb walls. And note the colour of the Afar people, some seem jet black and others are a lighter shade of brown. Regardless of all of this, Champollion admits in the above quote that in actual fact the Egyptians also depicted themselves as people of apparent jet black skin. I repeat what he said, quote, we find there the Egyptians and Africans represented in the same way which could not be otherwise. Which could not be otherwise. And note the reliefs are complete with hieroglyphic labelling. It's almost as if the Egyptians knew there'd be racists thousands of years in the future trying to misrepresent them. In the end, you can see why Champollion concluded, and I repeat, quote, The ancient Egyptians belonged to a race quite similar to the present inhabitants of Nubia. Close quote. But with that, we can all pack up and go home, right? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> you all must be new to this game. We can't wrap this up yet, no, 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 the detractors are already reading their excuses and rationalizations for the comment section. We need to make this completely airtight and undeniable. But before we do this, I would be remiss not to point you to the amazing channel of Kueli Mika who has several videos on this topic and on whose giant shoulders I am standing. He has a more detailed video on the skin colour of the Egyptians and why and how they depicted themselves in the ways they did. Please go and check out his video on this topic and his other work. A link is in the video's description below. Seriously, Kueli Mika is an amazing researcher and absolute treasure. Now having seen what Champollion the Younger had to say on this issue, let's take a look at what an even earlier visitor to Egypt said on the topic. Constantine Francois Volney was travelling and exploring the ruins of ancient Egypt well before it became a fashionable thing in Europe. In his day, he was recognised even by his rivals as a major authority on ancient Egypt. Here's what Volney had to say in his book, Travels Through Syria and Egypt. Quote, If we consider the distinguishing features of modern Egyptians, we find them all characterized by a sort of yellowish dusky complexion, which is neither Grecian nor Arabian. They have all a puffed visage, swollen eyes, flat noses and thick lips. 
in short, the exact countenance of a mulatto. I was at first tempted to attribute this to the climate, but when I visited the Sphinx, I could not help thinking the figure of that monster furnished the true solution of the enigma. When I saw its features precisely those of a negro, I recollected the remarkable passage of Herodotus in which he says, For my part, I believe the Colchians to be a colony of Egyptians, because like them, they have black skin and frizzled hair. That is, that the ancient Egyptians were real Negroes of the same species with all the natives of Africa. And though, as might be expected, after mixing for so many ages with the Greeks and Romans, they have lost the intensity of their first color, yet they still retain strong marks of their original conformation." End quote. This is actually quite sad to read. It shouldn't be, but to see how truthful white scholars once were about the Africanicity of ancient Egypt and to compare that to the attitude today, again, you have to ask yourself, what happened? Right. Just listen now to what Volney goes on to say, quote, How are we astonished when we reflect that to the race of Negroes at present our slaves and the objects of our extreme contempt, we owe our arts, sciences, and even the very use of speech. And when we recollect that in the midst of those nations who call themselves the friends of liberty and humanity, the most barbarous of slaveries is justified, and that it is even a problem whether the understanding of Negroes be of the same species with that of white men?" End quote. Wow. Just wow. Voni, a white man, is saying how enraging it is that to the black race belongs probably the oldest, grandest civilization we know of, and yet that same black race in his day was being treated like you know what. And Voni called it out. For this, Monsieur Voni, I say thank you, sir. You were truly a man of integrity. Next, we have John Stuart Mill. Now, this entry is personal. I had to study this guy just to get my law degree. If you're studying legal philosophy, you just can't escape John Stuart Mill. Why? Well, Mill's liberal approach to law is why we don't throw people in jail any longer for owing money to a bank or sleeping with another man's wife. Now, I didn't know why at the time, but compared to the other fathers of legal philosophy I was forced to study at university, I loved John Stuart Mill. When I discovered this quote about a year ago, I knew why. The guy was a mental genius. Listen, quote, it is curious that the earliest known civilization was we have the strongest reason to believe a Negro civilization. The original Egyptians are inferred from the evidence of their sculptures to have been a Negro race. It was from Negroes therefore that the Greeks learnt their first lessons in civilization and to the records and traditions of these Negroes did the Greek philosophers resort as a treasury of mysterious wisdom. But I again renounce all advantage from facts, where the whites born ever so superior in intelligence to the blacks and competent by nature to instruct and advise them, it would not be the less monstrous to assert that they had therefore a right either to subdue them by force or circumvent them by superior skill." Close quote. And once again, you have another renowned scholar, fine, he wasn't an expert Egyptologist, but a heavyweight in his field nonetheless, saying it's quite clear the ancient Egyptians were a black people. So, asks Mr. Mill, why then this complete fabrication of the idea that they are any less than us white people? This is amazing. If you missed it when I mentioned Volney's account earlier, I'll spell it out again. These are white people living in some of the most racist eras of white history, and yet they are sticking their necks out and not just saying ancient Egypt was black, but they are using that fact to challenge the racism and fake science of their day which claimed blacks were naturally less intelligent and therefore deserved to be enslaved and have their lands occupied. Now let me take a minute 
here to say that True Black is sending out a message to our white brothers and sisters out there. And people like Eamon Coyle, one of our regular commenters and earliest supporters who happens to hail from Ireland. Because of people like you, we know this struggle isn't a black against white thing. It's a struggle of decent human beings against indecent, insincere, willfully ignorant people. Our white and other non-black allies, just like John Stuart Mill and Count de Volney, have been in the trenches with us almost since forever. Real recognizes real, black or white, and we thank you, we salute you, and we need you more than ever now, so don't let up. I wish the same could be said for the next guy, the late great Egyptologist Emile Ameleno, who admitted the blackness of Egypt but only through gritted teeth. As Sheikh Anta Diop points out in his amazing book, The African Origin of Civilization, even after admitting the blackness of the ancient Egyptians, Ameleno tried to attribute the higher elements of Egyptian culture and history to a vague, lighter skinned race of people he conjures up with no evidence whatsoever. Anyway, we'll ignore that side of him and focus on what he had to say when he was being honest. Amelino, who discovered but also destroyed numerous ancient Egyptian tombs, you have to wonder why, said this, quote, From various Egyptian legends, I have been able to conclude that the populations settled in the Nile Valley were Negroes, since the goddess Isis was said to have been a reddish black woman. In other words, as I have explained, her complexion is Café Ola, coffee with milk, the same as that of certain other blacks whose skin seems to cast metallic reflections of copper." Close quote. And there we go. There is that reddish-brown colour the ancient Egyptians used to depict themselves. And Melino himself does not deny that blacks can come in much more than one shade. He says the goddess Isis seems to have been a negro, but of a coffee with milk type, of a type, quote, whose skin seems to cast metallic reflections of copper, close quote. Amelino goes on to conclude that, quote, if Osiris is of Nubian origin, although born at Thebes, it would be easy to understand why the mythical struggle between Set and Horus took place in Nubia. In any case, it is striking that the goddess Isis, according to the legend, has precisely the same skin color that Nubians always have and that the god Osiris has what seems to me an ethnic epithet, indicating his Nubian origin." Close quote. Finally, Amelino says, quote, It clearly follows from what has been stated earlier. Egyptian civilization is not of Asiatic but of African origin, however paradoxical this may seem. We are not much accustomed, in fact, to endow the black or related races with too much intelligence, or even with enough intelligence to make the first discoveries necessary for civilization. Yet there is not a single tribe inhabiting the African interior that has not possessed and does not still possess at least one of those first discoveries." Close quote. <laughs> wow. I don't even have to say anything about that last sentence. I, I can't even... Amelino was basically saying here that I know we go around telling ourselves that blacks aren't as intelligent as us, but that just might not be the case. Look at ancient Egypt for a start. <laughs> now, for someone that tried in other parts of his work to shoehorn white supremacy into ancient Egypt, this is pretty honest. He basically confesses his own and others' prejudices before admitting that the ancient Egyptians were black. At least Amelino was braver and more honest than most Egyptologists today who have the same biases but just won't admit it. Someone else who looked at Egyptian mythology and religion and concluded on that basis that the Egyptians were black was Egyptologist Sir Ernest Wallace Budge. Budge argued that the religion of Osiris had emerged from an indigenous African people. In his book Osiris and the Egyptian Resurrection, he says this, There is no doubt that the beliefs examined herein are of indigenous origin, Nilotic or Sudani in the broadest signification of the word. Now if we examine the religions of modern African peoples, 
we find that the beliefs underlying them are almost identical with those ancient Egyptian ones described above. As they are not derived from the Egyptians, it follows that they are the natural product of the religious mind of the natives of certain parts of Africa, which is the same in all periods." Close quote. If that wasn't clear enough, in his book Egyptian Sudan, Bodge went on to say this, quote, Many facts go to show the persistence of Negro influence on the beliefs and manners and customs of the dynastic Egyptians. And the most important thing of all in connection with this is the tradition which makes them to come from the land of Punt. Punt was situated in Africa at a considerable distance to the southeast and south of Egypt. The Egyptians claimed to be of divine origin, their primitive home being the divine land or the land of the spirits, i.e. Punt. Close quote. But again, like many of his contemporaries, Bodge fails at the last hurdle and goes on to invent a mystical race from the East who must have civilized the original inhabitants of Egypt and brought them high arts and technology. Disappointing, because he cites no evidence for this idea. It's just a postulation by a guy who, like many today, just can't get it into his head that black Africans gave the world ancient Egypt. But let's move on to someone much more honest than Bodge, man like biblical scholar, archaeologist and Egyptologist extraordinaire, Edouard Naville. Naville was fascinated with something you will hear very little of among Egyptologists today, the Edfu texts. The Edfu texts are a series of reliefs at the Edfu temple which tell myths crucial to the ancient Egyptians' beliefs and how he saw the world. Naville worked out from these texts in his book, The African Origin of Egyptian Civilization, that the ancient Egyptians, quote, undoubtedly came from the south. He says, and again I quote, if we consult the legend as it is preserved in a series of large paintings that adorn one of the corridors of the Edfu temple and which dates from the Ptolemaic epoch, we can see that the god Harmakish reigned in Nubia upriver from Egypt. Close quote. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Do me a favor, please. Get out of here. Get out of here, man. Wait, 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 wait. There's something big to note here. The Edfu Temple was built at a time during which the Greeks ruled Egypt. That's way after several invasions from white-skinned foreigners like the Persians and Babylonians. And even then, the dominant population, culture and historical memory of indigenous Egyptians was still black enough that when the Edfu temple was inscribed, they were talking about their origins being in the heartland of Africa. Come on, the deniers are just embarrassing themselves at this stage. Well. Let's carry on and embarrass them some more. Naville says this, quote, The god Harmachis left Nubia with his son Horus, a warrior god who conquered the whole country for him, as far as the city of Zar, now Kantara, a fortress built on the easternmost branch of the Nile. This was the Pelusiac branch, which blocked any arrival from the direction of the Sinai Peninsula and Palestine. <clears throat> blocked any arrival from the direction of the Sinai Peninsula and Palestine. Anyway, to continue, quote, In the principal Egyptian cities, the conquerors ruled whatever had to do with religion. In several localities, Horus settled his companions who were called blacksmiths. Thus, the introduction of metalwork is connected with the conquest in the legend. This legend which must belong to ancient tradition seems to me to merit attention. It agrees completely with what Greek historians tell us, namely that Egypt was a colony of Ethiopia. Thus the Egyptians, at least those who became the Pharaonic Egyptians, probably followed the course of the Great River. This is confirmed by certain features of their religion or customs." Close quote. Is there even any need to carry on? Oh, go on then. Just for all you 
beautiful Afrocentrics out there. But pay attention to what Naville says in this next series of sentences. Here we go. Quote, the Egyptian gets his bearings by looking towards the south. The west is on the right, the east is on the left. I cannot believe that this means that he is headed towards the south. On the contrary, he turns toward his country of origin. He looks in the direction from which he came and from which he may expect help. From there, the conquering forces emerged. From there too, the beneficial waters of the Nile bring fertility and riches. Besides, the south has always taken precedence over the north. Close quote. For those who didn't quite catch that, Naville is confirming something we pointed to in our first video in this series titled, Was God the First Afrocentrist? Link is in the description. In the Bible's book of Ezekiel, it says this, chapter 29, verse 13 and 14. Yet thus saith the Lord God, at the end of forty years will I gather the Egyptians from the people, whither they were scattered. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. According to the Bible and Edouard Naville, the Egyptian looked to Pathros or Patruzi, the Southlands, deep into Africa when he spoke of his origins. I just love saying that word. <laughs> I think you guys can probably figure that out by now. Patros. One more time, one more time. Patruzi. Patros. Okay, stop. Well, this whole Pathros issue is akin to asking a white person today where they come from and they return with, well, based on the technical anthropological term Caucasoid, I'm guessing originally the Caucasus Mountains in Eastern Europe. Likewise, according to Naville, the Egyptian man, judging by his legends, mythology and religious beliefs, believed his ancestors and original kings came from Nubia deep in the heart of Africa. Now if they weren't a black people, why are they saying this at all? Why aren't they pointing to the Levant or the Middle East? We'll leave that to the side and end this video with a man called Frédéric Caillot. Frédéric was an expert biologist, mineralogist and naturalist whose work changed the face of Egyptology. According to AramcoWorld.com, in his book Travels to Meroe, Frederick offered groundbreaking information on the peoples and regions south of the Nile's first cataract. He also gave the first scientific survey of ancient Sudanese monuments. He didn't stop there though. He brought back textual material that helped Jean-Francois Champollion decipher the hieroglyphic language of ancient Egypt. So esteemed were Caillot's contributions to Egyptology's progress that in 1824 he was given France's highest civilian award, the French Legion of Honour. Let's look at what this learned man had to say in his famous book, Travels to Meroe. Quote, Before leaving Nubia, I shall take the liberty of jotting down a few observations capable of establishing the anteriority of its civilization to that of Egypt. Close quote. By anteriority, Mr. Kayo means what came before or gave birth to. He says this, quote, This question, still unanswered by historical documents, acquires in my view much clarity when we carefully examine the monuments and natural productions of Ethiopia or Upper Nubia. I have reported a great number of ancient usages which have continued in Nubia but have left no traces in Egypt. We cannot, I agree, draw from this any proof that these usages were not born in Egypt. But if we are to establish that the principal objects used in the cult of the ancient Egyptians were products belonging exclusively to Ethiopia, one will be led to recognize that this cult was not created in Egypt. It is rightly said that migrations of peoples seeking a settlement go down river. Adopting this natural trend, we could not refuse to conclude that Ethiopia was inhabited before Egypt. Thus, Ethiopia was the first to have laws, arts, writing. But these civilizing elements, still crude and imperfect, were greatly developed in Egypt, which was favored by the climate, the nature of the soil, and the geographical position. Close quote. 
Kayo is saying that Ethiopian civilization most likely came first and Ethiopians or Nubians or whatever the designation you want for black Africans, well, they then traveled downriver to present day Egypt, bringing their law, religion, science and so on, and developed it to a greater level in Egypt. He's also saying, when he says a great number of ancient usages have continued in Nubia but have left no traces in Egypt, that even in his day, he could still see the remnants of ancient Egyptian religion and culture in some of the people of Sudan, which is pretty strong anthropological evidence that when the Egyptian kingdom and the empire declined after successive invasions from outside Africa, a lot of Egyptians and their culture proper simply receded southwards into Africa, where it came from originally. Pretty simple. No controversy whatsoever if you're dealing in basic logic and reasoning 101, not emotion and racism. Now, at this stage of the video, I could go on. I could cite renowned American classical scholar from the 1800s, Charles Anton, who said, quote, From what has been adduced, we may consider it as tolerably proved that the Egyptians and Ethiopians are the same race whose abode from the earliest periods of history were the regions bordering the Nile. Close quote. Oh, oops, I just did. I actually just did just go on to cite this American scholar. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I can't find the direct source for this last quote other than what I found someone quote online. Uh, so community, if anyone can dig up its provenance, I'd be most grateful. That wraps up this episode of Who Were the First Afrocentrists. It's been exhausting, but it had to be done. And as much work as has been put into this video, it could have gone on for at least another hour. Really guys, this used to be an almost uncontested thing. There's so much material from the fathers of Egyptology that demonstrate that when people claim that the ancient Egyptians were black, they're doing so on solid ground. Think about it. All of modern Egyptology is based on what these men discovered, down to the deciphering of hieroglyphics, and here are these long dead experts speaking still from the grave, telling you that the ancient Egyptians were black Africans. Again, I ask, what happened to make this even a debatable issue? That is for another video. Stay tuned for that one. In the next video in this series, we'll have a look at what the ancient Greeks and Romans had to say for who the Egyptians were. Yes, Greeks were Afrocentrists too. Boy oh boy, I can't wait for that one. Now if you stayed until the end, then you're either a lover of our work or a really passionate hater. Whichever one it is, please make it count, like and subscribe, and remember to rep black right.